All right, welcome back to the next part. Hopefully this will be our last part. We're gonna talk briefly about different membrane extensions and then we're gonna get into talking a little bit about uh, DNA and RNA and then possibly a little bit about protein synthesis. So um, we have a couple different membrane extensions that can exist off of different cells. Uh, we have something known as cilia and we have something known as flagella or a flagella, a flagellum uh, being singular. Now cilia, are these small, wavy, hair-like processes that exist on the apical surface of a cell that line the lumen. And what they do is they serve to generally propel and move different substances across the surface. And so we see this in the respiratory tract. In the respiratory tract, sometimes it's referred to as the mucociliary escalator. And what that means is that the cilia are moving things, moving mucus and different... Um, products up, generally up, out of the respiratory tract to the pharynx where we can then do a couple things. You can either spit that out if it's mucus or phlegm or you can swallow it. Uh, it's really up to you. Um, we also have flagella or a, flage a flagellum. And what this is, is it is a single um, membrane extension uh, composed primarily of, of, of actin filaments. And it is used for locomotion, so for movement. And we find it only on a single cell in the human body, and this is on the male sperm cell. Okay, so sperm cell is the male gamete. It's haploid. It contains half the genetic information, the other half from the mother's egg. And at the end of this sperm is the flagellum. And what this flagellum allows for is it allows the sperm to be able to become motile and move um, as it... Um, exits the male reproductive tract and enters the female reproductive tract as it navigates its way to hopefully find a viable egg that it is able to fertilize. And so we have a possibly a bacterium here with uh, cilia off of its surface. And here you can see a, a uh, this may be a uh, bacteria here with some flagella, but in our, in our bodies and in, in humans' bodies, uh, the sperm cell is the only one with a flagella. So we'll now get into talking briefly about nucleic acids, uh, DNA, and RNA. So we have nucleotides. Nucleotides are the monomer, the building block of nucleic acids. Okay. So uh, nucleotides are going to be made of three primary parts, uh, all of them, and they'll differ slightly in their uh, nitrogenous space, and they can also differ in their uh, sugar between DNA and RNA. So you have a nitrogenous base, you have a monosaccharide, and you have a phosphate group. The nitrogenous base can differ, and the monosaccharide can differ between RNA and DNA. And we'll take a look at that. So in DNA, our nitrogenous base, we have either adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine, so A, T, C, and G. A and T always bind together, C and G always bind together. For the monosaccharide, you have something called deoxyribose. So it's a, um, it is essentially a ribose sugar that does not have a particular uh, oxygen molecule off of its uh, two prime carbon. And we'll take a look at that, and you'll see exactly where that where that lies um, in the DNA molecule. It exists in a double helical shape, so two strands twisted around each other. And where these two uh, nitrogenous bases uh, bind and bond together between the A and the T and the C and the G, you get a hydrogen bond. And we know that hydrogen bonds are relatively weak, um, and this is uh, beneficial whenever we're needing to replicate our DNA because we need to be able to break these bonds. Um, there are different numbers of hydrogen bonds that form between A and T and C and G. A and T form two hydrogen bonds. C and G form three. And so it is um, less energetically favorable to put in a wrong base because A and T like to form two, C and G form three, so it's harder to put in an A with a C or a G with a T because the number of bonds um, isn't as, uh, the number of hydrogen bonds uh, doesn't line up. It, it can happen, um, but it's less favorable, less energetically favorable. So here's a a little more complex structure of DNA. And so what you see 
is you see um, you see a nitrogenous base, so adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. You see a monosaccharide here, so in blue. And what you note is off of the so this is this corner where my mouse is. Hopefully you can see it. This is called the one prime carbon, two prime, three prime, four prime, and then this carbon up here is the five prime. Off of this two prime, there's not an oxygen. So if you're lacking an oxygen, you call it deoxyribose. Okay. If you come over and look at RNA, now you see you have that oxygen there. So instead of deoxyribose, you just call it ribose. Now the other difference with RNA is you swap out thymine and you put in uracil. Okay, and so we'll talk about that as well. So another thing to um, keep in mind with DNA, uh, it's it's the same with RNA, but we're going to talk about it just with DNA. Is there is a directionality to DNA? DNA is not um, haphazardly arranged. It has a specific arrangement. So what you can see on the left side of this picture is the double helical nature of DNA. And what you can see here in the middle where my mouse is, is that same structure, but it has been untwisted. It's no longer helical in shape. And so what you have are you have two ends. You have a five end and a three end, or a five prime end and a three prime end. And so how we were counting the carbons earlier, here you have a one prime, two prime, three, four, and five. You have the same thing here. You have a one, two, three, four, and five. So this end up top is the five prime, where the phosphate group is going to hang off here. And then you have a one, two, three prime here, which is where this hydroxyl in uh, OH is a functional group called a hydroxyl group. So three prime contains the hydroxyl end, five prime contains the phosphate end. On the other strand, it's exactly the opposite. So it is, you can see that this row here is essentially this row flipped upside down. So now you still have the same thing. Three prime, so one prime, two, three, four, and five. Off the three prime, you have the hydroxyl. Off this five prime end way down here, you have the phosphate, but the ends are um, opposite. Up here, you have five prime on this side. On this side, you have three. Down here, you have five. Down here on this side, you have three. So this is what's called anti-parallel. They are parallel. They're running in the same direction, um, or they're adjacent to each other, but they're anti-parallel because one is going from three prime to five prime. One is going three prime to five prime, but in the opposite direction. Okay. So hopefully this makes sense. All the three and the five are referring to are the particular carbon. Uh, so you have one, two, and three. And then which end is that on? Is that free down here? And then when you go up, you have the five that's free on the top. So this is moving uh, five prime to three prime this way. This is moving five prime to three prime this way. This is important because certain enzymes, whenever you talk about uh, DNA replication and protein synthesis, certain enzymes only move in one direction. They move in the three prime to five prime direction. And then whenever they lay down new uh, bases for a new DNA strand or for mRNA, they lay it down in the five prime to three prime direction. So there's a, uh, there's a directionality to DNA that's very important. So how we are going to pair bases in DNA, we said it's always A to T or T to A and then C and G or G to C. We said that they are uh, A and T form two bonds, C and G form three bonds, so it's it's more energetically favorable to put C and Gs together and A and Ts together. Um, and how you do this is you have to first split up your DNA. So if we go back and we look here, you can see that these are bonded together, As and Ts and Cs and Gs. Well, you can also see the number of bonds here. Between A and T, you only have two, C and G, you have three, C and G, you have three again. So what you have to do is go in and break these bonds. And you break these bonds via an enzyme called DNA helicase. Okay, DNA helicase comes in, splits up these hydrogen bonds, and keeps the two strands separate. You then have an enzyme called DNA polymerase come in. DNA polymerase begins to lay down new nitrogenous bases. So if there's a T, it'll put in an A, C, G, G, a C, T, and A, A, a T, A, a T. 
and you continue this process until you have completely replicated the whole strand. The two come back together and now you have uh, two new DNA strands, each one with one strand that is brand new and one strand that is from the previous DNA molecule. So because of this um, because of this idea that you conserve one strand but you have to make a new one, it's called semi-conservative or semi-conservative process DNA replication is. So it's anti-parallel. We talked about that. It is semi-conservative and sometimes you can refer to it as semi-discontinuous. Now we don't get into the specifics of semi-discontinuous. Uh, you would do that probably more in a general biology course, not necessarily an anatomy course. Um, but enzymes are moving in different directions and on a particular strand of DNA you have to start and stop more often and what you end up is you end up with these little gaps of regions of DNA that have not been uh, replicated. So you have to go in and fill those so it's discontinuous but it's semi-discontinuous because it's only on one strand that you have that. Okay, So semi-discontinuous, anti-parallel, and semi-conservative. Okay, so that's DNA. Let's look at RNA now. So RNA is used um, to make proteins, and you get the RNA using DNA as a template. So RNA is single-stranded, generally. It, it contains a ribose sugar instead of a deoxyribose, and it contains the nitrogenous base uracil instead of thymine. So here you can see our DNA. We're going to transcribe just a single... Uh, section of that to make our RNA and then we can use that RNA to then make proteins in a process called uh, translation. So you transcribe something and then you translate it. And so uh, we will get uh, into that. So we have three different types of, of, of RNA. We have mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. mRNA stands for messenger RNA. This is essentially what this strand is here. This is an mRNA strand with uh, adenine thymine I'm sorry, adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine with a ribose sugar. And it is what will be used as the a strand during uh, translation to make our new proteins. Uh, tRNA stands for transfer. These uh, RNA molecules are going to transfer or carry amino acids from the cytoplasm to the ribosome where they'll be put into a polypeptide chain and then ultimately to a protein. And then rRNA, or ribosomal RNA, remember we said that's made in the nucleolus, it um, makes up, along with other different proteins, actually makes up the structure of the ribosome itself uh, that assists in protein synthesis. So we, so we know ribosomes help in protein synthesis, and ribosomes are made, um, along with proteins, are made of ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. So... Here you can see the three types. Here's our mRNA, which is the strand messenger. You can see rRNA that makes up our ribosome. And then you have tRNA, which is this stretch of RNA twisted around that will contain uh, these structures called uh, anticodons. And then this blue molecule here is uh, supposed to be represented of an amino acid. So this will bring amino, this, this, let's start here. This mRNA will be fed through this uh, ribosome that's made of rRNA, this tRNA molecule will bring this amino acid over to the ribosome where it will um, attach the amino acid to another amino acid in this growing peptide chain. Okay, So we'll talk in more detail about the specifics of protein synthesis and transcription translation uh, in another lecture video. So again, differences between ribose and deoxyribose is that oxygen off the two prime carbon um, here. And you can see you, this is how you would count the carbons. One, two, three, four, and five prime. And then you can see in DNA we have thymine, whereas in RNA we have uracil. So let's answer a few quick questions and we'll be done with this, uh, this lecture uh, video. So true or false, sperm have cilia to aid in their locomotion and movement. You should recognize this as being false. Sperm have a flagella or a flagellum to aid in their movement. Uh, where can we find cilia? We can find cilia in our respiratory tract. Uh, one that I, one location I didn't mention in the 
uh, fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes of uh, females, there are simple columnar cells, and these simple columnar cells are lined with cilia, and these cilia help to beat and propel uh, the ovulated egg down the um, fallopian tube um, as it makes its way toward the uterus for implantation if it was fertilized. Uh, DNA and RNA have two primary differences. What are these? Uh, well, one, you can see, there are probably more than two, but we'll just talk about two. There is the difference in nitrogenous base. So DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil. Um, and then there is a difference in sugar as well. DNA has deoxyribose, RNA has ribose. Uh, and then what is the function of a tRNA molecule? Well, if you remember the T in tRNA stands for transfer. So it is going to transfer amino acids from uh, the surrounding um, cytosol to the ribosome for them to be assembled into a polypeptide chain. So we will not get into protein synthesis uh, in this lecture, but we have another lecture for that. Um, so if you have any questions at all, again, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions, and I'll see you in the next video.